Live everywhere. Daily Co's Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Walker. Kegro in the morning show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Friday, December 2nd. What's the date? What's the year? 2016, believe it or not. Yeah. Uh, well, gee whiz. Uh, another tough day to get on the radio and do this stuff, but we'll make it through. Nonetheless, uh, I mentioned this morning in the uh, Daily Coast Radio is Live Now post that, yeah, this is another one of those Fridays. You get that sense, right? You know, Every once in a while you have a, a Wednesday or a Thursday that feels like a Friday, and this is one of those Fridays that feels like Berlin in 1933. And so, you know, you get over it. Eventually you wake up and realize what day it is. Uh, I don't know. Uh, the uh, I, I'm not sure what to make of the uh, transition period. I feel like we're in this sort of stasis period. Um during which uh, the the uh, crystal not, not yet having occurred, we begin to wonder whether maybe this whole thing has been overstated in the first place. But uh, I don't know. I don't think so. I think our uh, <clears throat> I think essentially all it is is that the slice of deplorables who were active neo Nazis just was never that big. They're just very mouthy. There's of course lots of danger. Uh, in the offing, in empowering them and encouraging them to actually pretend that they're part of the mainstream. But uh, I don't know. Luckily, uh, in some places, things appear to have died down. In others, of course, the hate crimes continue. Uh, by the way, I did find out this morning that the woman who was the subject of the latest viral uh, video having a meltdown as a alleged Trump voter in a uh, retail situation, the woman in uh, the Chicago area Michael's store. <clears throat> uh, I think we actually found this out the other day, but it's uh, making the rounds again. Apparently had a previous meltdown in a, also in a coffee shop, Starbucks. I guess they really need to do the decaf for these guys, I guess. She also had a Starbucks meltdown at some point, I believe, and, uh, and uh, or it may not have been a Starbucks. But it looked like it was in a coffee shop, or that's how it was being described. And uh, I guess the good news is she melted down and screamed at a white manager. So equal opportunity. So that's good. She just hates everybody, and it's uh, it's a good feeling. You get it warms the the cockles of your heart, as they say. And as Woody Allen once said, and I forget which movie about it. Great, just what I need: hot cockles. What was that love and death? All right. Well, anyway. Uh, not a usual source of quotes, Woody Allen necessarily, but okay. Uh, let's see. I don't know. There's no unifying Twitter outrage this morning, so far as I can tell, which that is a good thing. Maybe Trump got it all out at his rally yesterday. He rallied in where the Cincinnati area, I think. I, I just I didn't pay much attention to it. The, apparently, all the TV stations carried it, but I, I guess now they have the excuse of, well, he's the president elect. We we have to sort of track what he's doing. But very interesting. I don't believe we have seen in this country uh, anything quite like the post-election campaign style rally at which he railed against all the things he usually rails against. And of course, huge presence for the lock her up chant, despite the fact that he now says, oh, well, I'm not really going to lock her up. That that hasn't sunk in yet. Lots of uh, back and forth between um, Trump and the inner circle and the supporters about whether or not he should now or should earlier have been uh, interpreted literally in his remarks. Apparently, I, I this one I should dig up again. I just sometimes I see things fly by and then I realize the next day, ooh, that would have been a better topic for discussion. Should have put that aside to, to prove that I actually saw this. But somewhere along the line, I saw that uh, I guess Trump considered. His initial comments about helping to uh, save the jobs at the carrier plant, a, a campaign trail promise that he made to be sort of metaphorical. And that it wasn't until uh, he saw on TV a TV news interview with one of the workers there who said Trump said he was going to save our jobs here at the carrier plant. 
and he saw that report on TV, and I, I apparently his first reaction was, "I did, I said that. What? Oh, oh, oh yeah. Well, I, I didn't really mean that. Oh, well, I guess I got to do something now." So here we are. He's come up with the uh, package deal of paying Carrier seven million dollars to move two thirds of their jobs to Mexico, and uh, yeah, good work. By the way, tough guy Trump. Just uh, just to point out, I mean, he's not in office yet. That's true, but just to kind of point out. Uh, that, uh, you know, for all the tough talk, we're going to have a big, beautiful wall and Mexico is going to pay for the wall. When he sits down with the Mexican president, the report that comes out is, so what'd you tell him about the wall? Uh, yeah, about that. Uh, we didn't really actually, uh, we didn't really discuss the wall. Ugh. Then he, we found out the other day he had a phone call with the prime minister of Pakistan, which, you know, normal that. There's these post-election uh, congratulatory calls. Usually they take place after having a briefing on that country and arranging the call and using secure phone lines, etc. But, okay, he didn't do that, so whatever. Anyway, and uh, we got a readout of the call, and we're only getting readouts of the calls from the other governments, by the way. The other governments, the Pakistani government, more open with their records of their interactions with the president-elect than our own. Well, he's not government yet. Anyway... Uh, but the readout of it was he just had this simpleton's discussion. <clears throat> Although, I don't know how much of it is having a simpleton's discussion and then having that simpleton's discussion translated uh, by Pakistani translators uh, to to their own language and then translated back to English. Or maybe, you know, I, I, there's certainly, I don't know how they handle the translation. This is certainly entirely possible for the Pakistanis have a pretty significant portion of people who are educated in English, maybe they didn't have to do any translating at all, but, uh, you know, the uh, the idiomatic uh, 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 portion of the call, uh, the dialect back and forth, uh, so, you know, who, who knows how, uh, what kind of command of American, modern American English the folks on the Pakistani side of the call had, I, I, but it, it, you can't tell, it was either the simpleton we put on the telephone with their prime minister or the translation or recollection of it. But anyway, the whole call is, boy, is Pakistan fantastic. I'd sure love to come to Pakistan. It would be great. Uh, you people are wonderful. He's <laughs> literally saying all the Pakistanis I've ever met are fantastic people. You're going to be great. It's going to be wonderful. You And the, the, the PM invites him to Pakistan and he says, that would be great. I don't think he necessarily accepts the invitation. Anyway, point is, that uh, somebody then dug up, and I'm sure it was one of the many people who uh, sift through his his tweet stream professionally, pointing out that you know, years ago, when he tweeted about Pakistan, or Pakistan, if you want to say things a little bit more correctly, uh, Trump would rail against Pakistan. I think the tweet that they dug up was, you know, uh, Pakistan has been, had been at that point, harboring bin Laden for years. Some ally, he says about them. Now he gets on the phone with the guy, and all the Pakistanis are fantastic. Everybody I ever met who is from Pakistan is fantastic. You're fantastic. We love you. You guys are great. It was before Some ally. Not quite face to face, but on the phone, person to person, he's a choker. I mean, so much the better, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, one of the it could be worse. I'm glad the call was cordial and pleasant, and and it avoided any specifics because it was probably on an unsecured phone, and he had no briefing and no basis from which to discuss policy, and that might be his play. I'll take all these calls because we're not going to discuss anything important or significant or classified, because I don't know any of that. I'm just going to call everybody and say, your country's fantastic. So I guess that's okay. But I just thought that was interesting. So with the Mexican president chokes on the wall payment, good, fine, it was a stupid idea anyway. With the Pakistanis, he chokes on his complaints about bin Laden, good, fine, it was a stupid complaint anyway. Although I, I understand the, the, the sentiment, but that's a complexity I don't ever expect the new president to grasp, which is a little troubling. And then finally, I guess uh, this thing, well, not only uh, backing off of the lock her up, lock her up bit, now, I'm not going to do anything, we shouldn't do that, uh, but, the, you know, there are lots of issues wrapped up in that. But then the carrier thing, face-to-face -face with an actual problem on his hands instead of, I'm going to hit him with a tax like they won't believe if you move any jobs out of the country. Oh, you're moving two-thirds of your jobs out of the country? Here's a big tax break I'll arrange for you.
Mm, okay, well, he's a big softy, I guess, making great deals for America. I really don't know why we consider that to be so great. Okay, well, that's where we are this morning. I guess uh, the other thing occupying my mind this morning was a jobs report day. I'm sure Greg will have some information on that. And uh, I just wanted to note for the record, uh, as I did on Twitter this morning, that uh as BLS is now reporting, I see Mark Noller tweeting out, he usually does this, uh, in the morning, uh, 178,000 new jobs in November, national unemployment rate declining to 4.6%, the lowest since August 2007. I will note for the record, my son had a uh, economics class assignment that was due today. It's a little short notice on this assignment, by the way, teacher. So I'd point that out to you if you're listening. Uh but, you know, as as you might expect to see in an economics class in high school, they say, uh, well, there's a new president coming in. What are his economic policies? And let's analyze them. And what do you think of them? And what does he have to say about debt, deficit, trade, unemployment, uh, fiscal policy in general? You know, examine all these uh, areas, uh, inflation. What do you think the Fed ought to do given this? What do you think the Fed ought to do about that? Which is a good assignment, except for the fact I can't tell that the, if the teacher is, you know, at all interested in Trump one way or the other or whether, I mean, it might be an assignment to point out to the kids, hey, sometimes there's people who are uh, in charge of things who have no real grasp of actual economics at all, and you should learn about that. But she... She needed them to analyze his plan, to which I said, good luck with that one. There's nothing to analyze. Uh, and two, to take a look at the information that he had on his website with regard to the economy and, and weigh that. And I, we, had, we pointed out last night we didn't have the new jobs numbers, but I, of course, knew the jobs numbers from before. And he pointed out to me, he's like, hey, you know, and he knows where the score is with Trump. But he says, you know, the incoming president-elect, he didn't call him that, but he says unemployment is the highest it's been in decades, that it's unbelievable, it's through the roof, that one in five families in the United States has no one at all gainfully employed in any way. And that, uh, you know, Latino unemployment is uh, double what it was when Obama took over. He's got all kinds of insane quote-unquote facts all over it and who knows it was a group project and so some of the other kids in the group had to fill in the the grid spaces and they you know they had been told to go to the trump website and analyze this thing so the, the analysis begins from these ludicrous facts i'm and i'm looking at his assignment sheet being filled in by other kids with information that's just from another planet. I am wondering, how is this going to be scored? Is that a correct answer in the eyes of the teacher? Not because she's necessarily, a, I don't know if it's a he or she, actually. Not because they're a Trump fan, but because that's the information that's there, and now we need to discuss whether it's real or not. I, I will be very interested. Perhaps on Monday we can discuss what happened in class if I find out, you know, how, how was your day, son? Yeah. So we'll see what kind of information we get. But I guess across the country. High school, college economics students are being tasked with studying this plan that has no basis in reality based on facts that aren't real. Uh, gee whiz, fake news. Uh, we're going to have a bigger impact than we thought. We can sort it out, but can the kids? I don't know. What do you think, Greg? Good morning, by the way. When, when my kids were in uh, high school, there were only two kinds of days, you know. It either sucked or it didn't suck. Yeah. How was today? Oh, it didn't suck. Yeah. Oh, well, it must have been a fantastic a day, right? Everything, well, yeah, it didn't suck. That's, uh, well, that's good news. Uh, oh, by the way, and speaking of other good news, uh, Bill in Portland, uh, he's, uh, in addition to his morning, usual morning tweet, wanted to point out, uh, Buzz Aldrin's okay. Buzz okay. Aldrin, uh, uh, was evacuated from Antarctica. Right. And, uh, the, and then because, you don't need like, any what was he doing in Antarctica? I don't know. What was he doing on the moon? Well, uh, uh, related, you know, he has a, <laughs> this guy goes a desire anywhere. for thrills, you know, and he took this uh, uh, elite one uh, percenter uh, uh, adventure tour mm. to Antarctica, yes, and then got real sick. Sounds like he got uh, high, uh, he got the pulmonary edema. Oh, but he's and okay now. Could have been high altitude pulmonary edema. I don't know. Maybe from the plane flight. I don't know. 
Oh, but they had to didn't get it from the moon. But please, doing okay. All right. But, but I looked at the news last night. I heard that. I looked at my wife, and we both said to each other, what is he doing there at his age? I don't know. George H.W. Bush jumps out of airplanes. Not anymore, but uh, at an advanced age, let's say, and good for him. Mm. And uh, and wears crazy socks now. That's also a big thrill. Right. We say that being closer to his age than we would like to admit, by the way. Yes. Uh, and uh, not admitting that there are people that worked for him that we would maybe want to push out of an airplane. But uh, but with a parachute, stuff. I'm just trying to help them get over their fears. Right. So a couple of comments on your introduction. Yes. First of all, when you were talking about the Pakistani interpretations and yes. the back and forth with uh, world leaders, I actually thought of a different Woody Allen film that was the <laughs> Bananas film with the uh, interpreter that did English to English. Yes. Well, that one. Um, and I think maybe uh, that's the quality of the interpreter that mm. uh, that Trump will hire because he doesn't want anybody that doesn't speak English anyway. Oh. Uh, well, yeah, I, I have a lot of questions about that readout. And, and it, by it's the way, it's going to be funny to see him translate uh, the Brits. You know, yeah, that's not the first of the calls. I don't of understand you. I we... need a translator. <laughs> that's that's going to happen uh, mm. here with his Congress, but it, it's not the first call. I don't think. And it won't be the last that we only hear about by getting readouts from the other government. So right. I just, you know, that that's a bit of a problem. He really doesn't understand, I don't think, and, and doesn't care doesn't to care. and won't ever comply with the, uh, the disclosure and transparency rules surrounding public office. He thinks that's the sort of dumb red tape that, just causes problems. Of course, that's how he railed against uh, Hillary Clinton, and that doesn't really well, matter. You know, D Donald Trump is best seen as an old Groucho Marx movie, I think. You know, yes, this uh, uh, international affairs is totally childish. It's simple; a child could understand this. Go get me a child. I can't make hide nor hair of it. You know, <laughs> it, it, it's that kind of thing. The, the other thing is about the economy, and, and there are some interesting things to point out here. It's true. Uh, U.S. unemployment rate fell to 4.6. It's the lowest level since 2007. And as you pointed out, 178,000 jobs added in November. All good. But uh, a couple of things to point out. Uh, Jason Walfers points out that uh, the striking part of the payrolls report is that hourly earnings fell slightly this month and are up only 2.5% over the year. So as the economy booms, booms not everybody benefits. True. Which is uh, part of the theme of this election. And here's another one, which I found very striking from Betsy Stevenson. Mm -hmm. uh, unemployment by education. College, okay. 2.3. This is unemployment rate. Mm. Some college, 3.9. High school, 4.9. And less than high school, 7.9. Stay so in school. You could argue that's the election right there. Yes. In the Rust Belt states especially. You you could. And as a matter of fact, that reminds me as I'm looking at the 178,000 jobs created in November. That's actually now twice, more than twice the margin of, the, twice the difference in uh, where we are now and ending up with Hillary Clinton as president instead. In the, in the three states that everybody's been focusing on. Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, it's now down it's to, down to 47,000 or something like is that. Is it? Well, I, I understood it yesterday to be down to about 80,000 votes, which of course would mean that if 40 that, something thousand changed their minds, yeah. that would be all it would take to reverse the election. But an 80,000 vote margin, uh, yeah, I mean, if, uh, if those people, if half or less of the people who got new jobs in November, People are not grasping the <laughs> fact that this was a Bush-Gore kind of election yeah. where Clinton won the popular vote by five times mm -hmm. what uh, Gore did. Yeah. And yet the margin is almost as close as it was with that one uh, uh, Florida yes. situation. Well, there are people who are grasping it. It is the Republicans. That is to say, just as in the Bush-Gore election, being so, razor thin, they simply went out and said, we have a mandate anyway. They're hmm. doing the same thing now. Right, exactly. So grasp it. But, but I think that's important to, to recognize. At the same time, uh, those unemployment numbers, uh, I, I think, are important, you know, and, and yes. it, it's an incredibly uneven uh, economy and it's an uneven recovery. We know this to be true, and people voted that way. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's important not because oh they're stupid and they shouldn't have voted for Trump. We'll get to that because there are a lot of stupid people who did vote for Trump as well as other people who voted for Trump. But uh, 
th- there really were issues here that uh, whoever the president is, and we had hoped it would be a Democrat, really need to address and haven't been addressed adequately. And I don't think that that's unfair. Now, will the other side do a much worse job of it? Sure, in my opinion, that's why I vote the way I vote. But that's not the same thing as recognizing what the issue is. So so we have that. And you started talking about this a little bit yesterday. Uh, so I wanted to do a little bit more of this, um, you know, uh, prosperity gospel for economics. Ah, so, okay. Uh, so this is a, a piece from... McClatchy, supporters don't really care if Trump drains the swamp. President-elect Trump shares an update on the White House transition and his policy plans in a video that we will spare you. All right. But the swamp is in the eye of the beholder. As a candidate, Donald Trump promised to drain the swamp in Washington. Now he's been elected. He's embracing that establishment. Democrats and many in the media are slamming him as a typical politician who abandoned a principle as soon as it suited him. But when McClatchy checked in with several dozen voters in central Pennsylvania, one of the swing states that swung the White House to Trump to see how he defined the swamp, Mm -hmm. most didn't care. Instead, they said it's fine with him if he uses the expertise of a D.C. establishment of lobbyists, donors, and special interests to get his way as long as it's their way. Yeah. This is his thing. He's a successful businessman who hires people to get him what he wants. If he has to use swamp people to make America great again, why not? Yeah, yeah, why not? I don't really think he's going to do it. Asked whether Trump should make his promise to pull a plug on the swamp a priority. This other voter, Holly Mann, 61, retired teacher, shrugged. I don't think this should be the main thing on his mind right now. Everybody down there is involved in lobbying. It's going to take a long time. And Denise Jones, 54, in Port Matilda, Pennsylvania, agreed he would never get anything done, would he? This is real life. He can't just play with the good guys. The important thing is he doesn't need their money. So you read these. And you scratch your head and say, I can't make head or tail of what these folks are saying. They wanted to drain the swamp. He puts the very Mm -hmm. same people there who they say are the problem. And they say, I don't really care because he's going to do what they want. But they don't really express what it is they want. Nor does he do it. Nor does he do it. Nor does he do it. Right. So, uh, yeah. Here it is. To be frank, it's more important he gets things moving, like getting rid of Obamacare and fixing the schools and jobs. I don't much care how he does it. That's up to him. Most Trump supporters interviewed talked about trusting Trump, not in the sense that he'll follow through on draining the swamp, but he'll find the smartest way to make government work for them. Hmm. And he mentioned that he largely self-funded his campaign is not beholden to special interest. If Hillary had won, and you know she really is a swamp person, she would have had to pay back with favors all those interests. But he won't because, you know, he's flushing out the scum in Washington. Do I think Uh it's really going to happen? Nah. But better Trump swamp than Obama swamp. At least he's going to get us something. Maybe. Uh, and if he doesn't, that's okay. I mean, I, I re- certainly recognize the sentiment. It comes from a different place, but the, the, I mean, there, there are a million, well, I, I, there are certainly places where I thought, yeah, I'm not so sure about what's going on here policy-wise. In fact, it's kind of the opposite of what I was looking for or might even have thought I would have gotten from, say, the Obama administration. But do I trust him to, to handle it okay? Yeah, like, I mean, I mean, and, and it, it the trust was kind of paper thin where I said, Meh, it's not even that I would say I trust him to handle it. But when it came to things like the, well, detainee policy that I was, uh, you know, vocal about early in the, uh, in the, in the Obama administration until it became clear, he said, you know, it's not going to be a huge change in, in who's currently detained. We can kind of, you know, release, there's a certain class of prisoner we can re- release, but, uh, not everybody and, and not everybody will get a hearing in court and the drone policy that continued. And I said, well, you know, uh, I did resign myself in some cases to the possibility that, yeah, th- this is not going to match what I expect from an open and honest, uh, administration here. But I, but, but he said very plainly there, I can find no legal and ethical solution to what to do with some of these situations and the best we can do is say we're going to establish the guidelines we can to try to keep ourselves in check and that that would be something that would not play for me in the hands of trump who i don't trust and doesn't really play for me very well in the hands of obama either but at least i think differently about what would obama do in this situation than what trump would do in this situation. so so it it 
it basically boils down to, well, the thing about Obama is he's doing a bunch of stuff. Marcy Wheeler's an expert at pointing out some of the really difficult and uh, perhaps not great decisions made about uh, privacy, mm-hmm. uh, drone use, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, but his heart's in the right place. And so with a little prodding and with a little luck and maybe even with a little goading by folks like us, he gets to the right place. Yes, and Trump, maybe. his heart is not in the right place. He doesn't have one. Yeah. So therefore, we don't trust him at all. Right. And I suppose but you could look at it same. vice versa and say yeah. the other thing. The problem is the facts. The facts just don't match oh, that. Facts. Here's what I'm talking about. Oh. So now you have this other person. Uh, I forgot about uh, and, and just for the purpose of this discussion, it's Steve Mnuchin. Oh, uh, it's actually a Russian Jewish name uh, derived similar to Menachem, and oh. so that's how it's pronounced. That's very that interesting. Up. What are we going to? What is the all right going to do about? This? He's Russian. That's good. Jewish. That's bad. I don't know if he is, but that's where the name derives from. Hmm. Anyway, uh, this AP big story. AP when Donald Trump named his Treasury Secretary. Tina Colebrook felt her heart sink. Ouch. She voted for the president-elect on the belief he would knock the money to elites from their perch in Washington, D.C., and she knew Trump's pick for Treasury, Stephen Mnuchin, all too well. How did she know? Because Mnuchin foreclosed on her L.A. home. So, I just wish I had not voted, she said. I have no faith in our government anymore at all. They all promise you the world at the end of a stick and take it away once they get in. Less than a month after his presidential win, Trump's populist appeal has started to clash with a cabinet of billionaires and millionaires that he believes can energize economic growth. The prospect of Mnuchin leading the Treasury Department drew plaudits from many in the financial sector. A former Goldman Sachs executive who pivoted on, they wrote Goldman, I see here. Executive who pivoted, I fixed it for them, who pivoted in the early 2000s to hedge fund management and movie production, he seemed an ideal Hmm. emissary to Wall Street. When asked on Wednesday, <clears throat> About his credentials to be Treasury Secretary, Mnuchin emphasized his time running on One West, which not only foreclosed on Colebrook, but also thousands of others. What I've really been focused on is being a regional banker for the last eight years and know what it takes to make sure we can make loans to small bid market companies, and it's going to be our big focus. But the prospect of Mnuchin leading the Treasury Department prompted Colebrook and other One West borrowers who say they unfairly face foreclosure to contact the AP. Kohlberg wishes she could meet with Trump to explain why she feels betrayed by his cabinet selection. He doesn't want the truth. He's now backing his buddies and so on and so forth. Mm. Yeah, she talked about the fact that all of her tenants lost their jobs in the crash. They couldn't pay it back. It was a knock-on effect. And she's still challenging the foreclosure in court. So now she lives with a boyfriend in the small California city of San Luis Obispo. She volunteers at a homeless shelter. I cooked the homeless shelter there. But for the grace of God, go I. So you have these conflicting stories here. Some Trump voters don't really care. And other Trump voters who are actually affected by this and have a much better idea of what they're talking about here are furious. That would be the other basket. Yeah. So it's a complex situation. People are complicated. But this article that I found kind of ties it all together. It's in the American interest of all things. And Uh it's called Goldman Sachs Populism. Uh, What? (laughs) Okay. Since Donald Trump dined with fellow business tycoon Mitt Romney on young garlic soup with thyme and sautéed frog legs and tapped yeah. former Goldman Sachs banker Steve Mnuchin, just one of the many financial elites circling the Trump transition team, to run the U.S. Treasury, many journalists have revived an old attack on the president-elect. He's not a populist, but a garden-variety plutocrat, and his supporters who believed he was anything else were played for suckers. Hmm. That's what you think. That's what I think. But this article makes the uh, prosperity gospel argument that maybe not. It says, this argument may well end up being vindicated. By the way, I think it will. But the article says, no one, probably not even Trump himself, knows whether this will be an administration that mostly bows to the old school GPOP elite, or whether it will turn out to be something more innovative and unpredictable in a benign or destructive way. But the not a populist critique is at best premature and at worst destructive to the Trump resistance effort because it risks dismissing a core source of the president-elect's perpetually underestimated appeal. Simplistic proclamations that Trump's working-class supporters were duped because he continues to act like and associate with members of the super-rich involve three basic oversights. First, as Walter Russell Mead noted in August, rich and successful men from Catiline to Andrew Jackson to Ross Perot have presented themselves as populists from time immemorial. While Trump's populism rests in part on issue-based appeals, it's most pronounced in his political and rhetorical style. 
by flouting PC norms, reducing opponents and journalists to sputtering outrage as he trashes the conventions of political discourse and dismissing his critics with airy put-downs, he's living the life that some of the time a lot of the people wish they either had the courage or resources to live. And crucially, through social media ingenuity, he's offering support as a front row view of the entire spectacle. And during the primaries, Russ that had highlighted a related point. Trump's appeal is oddly like that of Franklin Roosevelt, rich, well-connected figure who's campaigning as a traitor to his class. So this gets at a second point about the social disconnect between journalists and Trump's electoral base. While most journalists would consider administration packed with pro-redistribution academic technocrats to be populist, more populist than one with strong influence in business leaders, white working class voters may not see it that way. One little known element of the gap, writes Joan C. Williams, is the white working class resents professionals but admires the rich. Yes, we haven't discussed that. Class migrants, white-collar professionals born to blue-collar families, report that professional people were generally suspect of managers or college kids who didn't know crap about how to do anything but are full of ideas about how I have to do my job. Now, I I talked about that a little bit this morning on Twitter when I tweeted that uh, comment about the uh, education, unemployment Hmm. statistics, where uh, uh, high school or less is in the sevens, and college is in the twos in terms of unemployment. Right. And draining the swamp, I said, wasn't getting rid of the lobbyists. It's getting rid of the college kids. Yeah. There's Probably. a tremendous amount of resentment from non-college people about college folks because you, you can't, you know, because the elites look at that, so-called elites, at least in terms of the, of the, uh, uh, the rural voters who, who wound up voting for Trump, you know, you might say, well, look, this just shows that you need to stay in school. They can't, they didn't, and at age 50 and 60, they're not about to go back to college. Yeah. So so what good is that kind of comment to them? I don't know. And uh, so this whole thing is, okay, I don't really understand how people get rich, but they are, and they're celebrities, and so they must know something, and I'd rather stick with them than these other people who uh, I want to get rid of. So if Trump gets in there and uses his uh, phony baloney uh, populist friends to get rid of all those smart college kids who told me what to do and then move my factory, more power to him. Uh, That's yes. really draining the swamp from my point of view. They're, they're yeah. saying. I mean, they are saying that. I mean, we don't think that's smart, but – we're elitist. So, well, but but then you get back to that you know other person who actually experienced what's going yeah. on here and says, wait a minute, it's not all about us; it's about him. He hired the guy who fired me. Yeah, unfortunately, her her other the other manifestation of her realization that this was garbage was, well, forget it. Now I'm not going to vote at all. Yeah, as exactly. Opposed to, as opposed well, to vote for the other party. Hmm. That that's the frustrating part from our point of view. And and then this one last piece because there were three pieces here. Finally, even to the extent that many of Trump's hires do represent the hated elite, his decision to bring him in his orbit might enhance rather than compromise his populist message. Here, once again, the divide between journalistic and Trumpian outlooks is worth remembering. Journalists and editors see offering someone a job as a sign of respect or approval. In Donald Trump's zero-sum adversarial world, hiring somebody is less a signal of approval than an act of subordination. So hmm. that's, you know, look at him and Romney, for example. Yes. If he gives Romney a job, it's not because he's complimenting Romney. It's because he's making Romney work for him. Yeah, yeah, that's a okay. good point. So in the end, uh, you have to you know, see how all of this plays out. There's those two different ways of looking at it. There's the first group, which McClatchy reports that we don't care so long as he does what he does and helps us. There's still a lot of uh, class and racist uh, – uh, uh, com- commentary buried in the fact that we sent him to Washington so he could help us. Who is us? Yes. You know, so, so that's a lot of that. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, you have the, but in the real world, his policies hurt us, and I'm beginning to realize that group of people. And really, that's what we have to see play out. So if you're in Trump opposition, as we are, you have to be real clear on that in terms of uh, which approach you're going to take. Yeah, they were conned, but they weren't conned in maybe the way that you think. They appreciate the fact that he, uh, you know, hired a bunch of people that would never be considered to be good guys. The point is, he's using his powers in their view for good instead of evil because he's going to help us. 
and he's going to stick it to them. And as long as you have that us versus them, that's the most important thing in the world, uh, you know, uh, point of view, uh, you're going to keep voting for folks like that. Yes, maybe. I guess that's, well, I, I don't know. I, you'll keep doing it as long as you can survive. You know, my, my, my analogy here, uh, as poor as it might be, is to the prosperity theology and the prosperity gospel. You have preachers who just keep saying, look, I'm going to take your uh, money from the congregation and I'm going to buy big houses. I'm going to buy lots of planes. I'm going, to ri- I'm going to live lavishly. And rather than you resent it, you're going to appreciate it for two reasons. The Lord helps those who helps themselves. So it's all part of being a good, you know, whatever it is I say I am. And at the same time, you want to be like me too. Admit it. So just, you know, uh, keep giving so that I could live the life that you want to live and, uh, you know, keep praying and maybe you'll get there too. And it may be that some of these guys uh, wind up uh, being exposed for con men or perhaps they don't uh, quite live the, the faith the way they're supposed to. And maybe they have these affairs and maybe they're gay and maybe uh, this and maybe that and, you know – but but why why do I say gay because they rail against it and yeah. then turn out maybe not you know but but it, it's hypocritical it, it, it doesn't matter because all is forgiven because that's how we do things and so you look and say how could this be a valid philosophy and how can people support this but a whole lot of people do and it doesn't matter that the individuals who are at the top of the food chain in this turn out to be flawed it just doesn't matter. I guess not. When are we going to see a fabulously wealthy, openly gay preacher? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't see why that should get in the way. I don't why don't know. Why equal opportunity? Start stealing, everybody. Right. Anyway, so, so you have all of that. And preacher. I think that, no you know, way. that's that's you know, one way of looking at the whole big picture in terms of looking at the Trump voter. Something that, you know, actually we've been following on the show for a long time, quoting folks like Chris Arnott and trying to not sympathize, which entails that you somehow think that it's okay for them to do what they do, but rather empathize, which is to say simply trying to understand without value judgments why folks do what they do. So I do feel a lot of empathy, but not much sympathy for people who were conned by Trump and then realize all he's doing is putting the same people in charge that screwed you. And it's especially important to look at it in terms of Steve Mnuchin and the banks because at the heart of this, continues to be, in my point of view, resentment at the elites, the college kids, if you will, for uh, allowing the 2008 economic meltdown and, frankly, not punishing people who were in charge of making that happen and who ran away with their homes. Yes. Even though, I mean, Mnuchin was was well publicized if you were watching as finance chair for the campaign but you know who knows how much attention she's paying to the news not enough i guess because she decided to vote trump but uh yeah not too much i can do for you there but uh we learned a lot about mnuchin yesterday and uh much of it is disturbing and i I don't know what to say except that uh, you can expect more of that considering how he made his money uh, and then he used that money to leverage himself the position with Trump, and then Trump put him in charge of all the money. So mm. it should be, it should get really good for you. Right. Two quick pieces, two lightning round stuff before I go. Uh, one is, I guess they had this big conference about the after the election uh, post mortems at Harvard. Oh yeah. And a shouting match erupts between Clinton and Trump aides. There's Why a New York Times and Washington Post in- piece in- on it, but because the paywall, I'll give you the Washington Post one. Oh, uh, all right. Uh, the raw, lingering emotion of the 2016 presidential campaign erupted into a shouting match here as top strategists of Hillary Clinton's campaign accused the Republican counterparts of fueling and legitimizing racism to elect Donald Trump. The extraordinary exchange came at a postmortem session sponsored by the Kennedy School of Government, where top operators in both campaigns sat across a conference table from each other. As Trump's team basked in the glow of its victory and singled out for praise its campaign's chief executive, Stephen K. Bannon, who was absent, because he refused to come. He knew he'd be protested. The row of grim-faced Clinton aides who sat opposite him bristled. Jen Palmieri, Palmieri condemned Bannon, who previously ran Breitbart. If providing a platform for white supremacists makes me a brilliant technician, I'm proud to have lost, she said. I'd rather lose than win the way you guys did. 
Kellyanne Conway, Trump's campaign manager, fumed. Do you think I ran a campaign where white supremacists had a platform? You did, Kellyanne. You did. Hmm. Do you think you could have just had a decent message for white working class voters, Conway asked? How about it's Hillary Clinton? She doesn't connect with people. How about they have nothing in common with her? How about she doesn't have an economic message? Joel Medicine, Chief's, uh, Clinton, Chief strategist, piled on. Those are dog whistles sent out to people. Look at your rallies. He delivered it. At which point Conway accused Clinton's team of being sore losers. Guys, I tell, I can tell you are angry, but wow. Hashtag, he's your president. How's that? Will you ever accept the election results? And uh, Matthew Dowd, noted centrist, was watching this yesterday and tweeted something along the lines of the exact quote that there is absolutely no um, uh, sense whatsoever of of humble or um, uh, mm. or, or uh, introspection or anything yeah. about anybody in the uh, Trump campaign. It's really amazing. Yep. Uh, they, yeah, they're, and they're not going to feel that. They're still basking and they'll bask for years. And this is the sort for of years, giant, right? Because we won. Therefore, yeah. it justifies it. I mean, their whole yeah. governing philosophy is F you, we won. Yes. And if you don't believe us, just look at the Electoral College and stop giving us this crap about the popular vote. And 70,000 voters would have made a difference one way or the other. Our governing philosophy is F you, we won. And if you don't get that, we're going to teach you over the next four years. Yes, and if you don't get it from their teaching, you'll get it from uh, retail setting meltdowns from Trump supporters letting you know. F you, not only did we win, On but planes I'm the, or at Starbucks I'm or the at stores, you know, because we've been empowered to go ahead and do this. And we've been wanting to tell you smart-ass college kids for years what we think of you, and we're going to. Yes. And then uh, finally, completely huh. different, but I just needed to finish this up because we started it yesterday. There's the other brother, Will Keith Kellogg, W.K. Kellogg. Oh. A much blander fellow, but oh. I just thought you'd enjoy this. Oh, uh, so he was an American industrial. This, this uh, Wikipedia piece is so much blander than the other one. But uh, a lot of this comes out of the Seventh-day Adventist church and practiced vegetarianism as a dietary principle taught by the church, the Kelloggs. He founded the Kellogg Arabian Ranch and made it into a renowned establishment for the breeding of Arabian horses. And then he started the Kellogg Foundation with $66 million in Kellogg Company stock, a donation that would be worth over a billion dollars today. And uh, he just he started out selling brooms. He went to Battle Creek. His brother was the doc. He helped his brother run the clinic. He had a big fight with his brother. We talked about this yesterday because John Harvey Kellogg allowed anybody who wanted to to watch the secret of how they made cornflakes the out secret. of corn. Okay. And uh, th- this guy, Will Keith Kellogg, was the businessman and said, don't do that. It's a proprietary secret. And the doc said, eh, what do I know about business? Go ahead and watch it. You know, it's, it's good for everybody. And that's where CW Post saw the method, stole it, formed Post Cereals, and then later General Foods. And that's how they became to be rivals. And uh, Will left the sanitarium and his brother's practice uh, because they just didn't agree about that. And besides, as we pointed out yesterday, the businessman, Will Keith Kellogg, wanted to add sugar and do uh, sugar frosted flakes, mm, which he eventually sugar. did and created his own company, and that became the Kellogg Company. It's amazing that the uh, dissident is the one that became the Kellogg Company. Yeah. Now, now here's an interesting thing I found about this, a little bit of noblesse oblige, that this uh, uh, Matthew Dowd's uh, observation about the Trumps, uh, it's mm-hmm. completely missing. A, a, another story to go with that. Uh, in 1930, he established the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, ultimately donating the money to it. I mean, real money, not just other people's money, like Trump did with the Trump Foundation fraudulently. Yes. But during the Great Depression, this Kellogg, Will Kellogg, directed his cereal plant to work four shifts, each lasting six hours. The reason he did that is during the Depression, he wanted as many people as possible in Battle Creek to have a job. That's nice. What were they doing with the cereal? What's that? Were people able to buy the cereal? I guess so, because they had to Were you able to eat the cereal? I have no idea what it tasted like. But uh, it it reminds me of a story. Uh, You know, uh, when you go to the um, the Roosevelt uh, Hyde Park, New York, Presidential Memorial Library, learn about uh, Mm -hmm. Social Security and how things were in those days. That was a very rich part of uh, New York at the time with a lot of uh, Dutch uh, New Yorkers, not just the Roosevelts, but also the Vanderbilts and some others there. And the Vanderbilt mansion is, is just down the block, so you wind up visiting that too. 
And uh, that was really a, 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 a Trumpian kind of uh, guilt, you know, before the income tax age uh, that ruined all of it for those folks uh, kind of place. But uh, there was, in those days, no refrigeration, and they uh, only lived in the place at certain times a year. But one of the times of the year that they lived there was in colder weather, and they had a rather large ice house where they would go down to the pond and people would cut blocks of ice and then lug it back over to the mansion and put it into the uh, insulated area and that would be where they stored the ice so that they could keep things cold. And as time went on and electricity got invented, uh, many other rich people went ahead and started installing these newfangled things called refrigerators. But not the Vanderbilts. The Vanderbilts kept the ice house. And the reason they kept the ice house is because it employed people in the area and they were unwilling to switch to the modern, uh, you know, electricity and just uh, have all those people lose their jobs because that's what they did and they didn't do anything else. Very interesting. Well, it's a Downton Abbey story. It is in a way, but, you know, part of the reason I bring it up is that this whole shift of uh, technology and what it means in terms of, of job loss and, and the relationship between the company and the workers, be it Henry Ford, uh, you know, th- there's always bad with the good. It's not like any of this is whitewashed or sanitized or anything like that, uh, but uh, it's completely lacking now. Henry Ford may have paid his workers more, not out of altruism, but because he wanted them to have enough money to buy his cars. But at least, you know, he had that in mind. Nowadays, it's, you know, whatever works. And if we need to, you know, move your jobs to Mexico because it saves us 15 cents, we're going to. Yeah. Despite what, you know, Trump says. And, you know, the fact that um, whether it's technology or whether it's decreasing price of goods, if productivity goes up without employment going up, uh, the people who own the factories benefit and the people who work in the factories don't. And and so, again, this disconnect between uh, what the people who own the factory and what the people who work in the factory have, want, and need uh, has always been there. It seems to me that, you know, whether you're looking at the coal miners in Virginia or uh, auto workers in Michigan or some of the uh, carrier um, air conditioning folks in Indiana, to right, a certain extent, the there was always a, uh, a desire to make sure that uh, labor, you know, got top wages and at least had a fair share of what was going on at the factory, hence unions. And nowadays, it's forget about all of that. I'll take a $2 an hour job so long as they don't close the factory. And that's more important. And let's just make sure that the factory owner, you know, gets all the possible breaks, give them $77 million in tax breaks so that they can spend a million dollars more. On uh, on on uh, jobs, you know, seems like a good deal for everybody, right? Yeah, completely different way of thinking about it now, which is rather odd and bizarre. And I just thought I'd point that out. It's not, you know, necessarily how we thought about all or any of this uh, twenty years ago, thirty years ago. Yeah, well, times are changing, as they that say, they are. Uh, and not for the better. Okay, so, so that's my Friday segment for today. Oh, Do with it what you will. <clears throat> what will I? I don't, I don't know. know. We'll Have some out. cornflakes for breakfast. This is Greg Dworkin so. speaking with David Waldman Kager in the morning who will never think of cornflakes the same way again. Take care, and I'll talk to you on Monday. Yes, okay. Thanks very much. Have a great weekend, Greg. Uh, stay away from that crazy cereal. Yeah, I Eat think I'll have some, some uh, eggs over easy. Yeah, good idea. Okay. Yeah. We'll talk about chickens on Monday. <laughs> oh, will we? All right. Very good. Well, I'll have that on uh, tap for Monday. Thanks again. Uh, good start. Uh, by the way, uh, news flash. I, I learned a little something. It doesn't really explain exactly why yet. Others of you in reaction to my reaction to this have explained why. Uh, I have mentioned in the past something totally irrelevant to everything, but it's weird. Donald Trump wears his ties way, 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 way too long. And it's disturbing and it's weird. And I can't, I didn't know why. Uh, many people, though, are offering the explanation that he's just, he's overweight, he's got a big gut, and he, he feels like his ties come to, uh, rest at an odd place on his frame if they have to go over his protruding gut. 
And so he wears them longer so it looks like they end at the place where they otherwise ought to. And you can tell when they're too long when he is leaning forward in a chair. Although I have also seen when he's just standing up straight. He still he still does it way too long so that even if it goes over his belly or maybe if he sucks it in a little bit for a photo, the tie goes down like to the end, goes like in front of the fly of his pants, comes out the bottom of his jacket if he's got the jacket buttoned. It's very weird looking and it's wrong and it's, uh, <laughs> and it's an issue. Anyway, uh, it only become, it only comes up because I see, uh, a tweet here, uh, from, well, Adam Smith, not the one who wrote the famous economics book, but a, uh, uh, someone else entirely. And you can see it if you wish. Uh, he's, uh, tweeting as Adam Smith, one word, underscore USA. So, you know, he's, very patriotic because the USA in there. And he's got this picture here uh, and notes. It's a picture of Donald Trump walking in the wind somewhere. And amazingly, it is not tearing the hair off of his head, though it is, it's playing games with the front of his hair. But the rest of his hair is plastered down enough. It has blown his tie, one of his blazing red ties, up over his shoulder outside of his jacket revealing the back of the tie as it does it and as he notes here uh donald trump the future president of the united states scotch tapes the back of his tie to the front and he does and i saw that mentioned last night and i wasn't really sure what to make of that and why he would be doing that i I mean i there's a fashion uh I don't know what you would call it. part of you know how the neckties work. I, mean, I assume you all know how neckties work. You've worn them at some point or seen someone uh, important to you wear one, or somebody on television putting one on, and you know that the tail end of the tie, uh, you know, goes underneath the the top end, uh, and and I guess when you're disheveled, you know, if you if you don't uh, hold the things together, you don't. I don't use it, but. Some people use tie clips or even tie tacks. That's sort of outdated these days. And instead, uh, whatever, if the wind blows, uh, okay, so your tie goes uh, helter-skelter. But uh, I don't know. I guess it's supposed to be some kind of an extraordinary embarrassment if both ends of the tie go different directions and the tail end of the tie comes apart from the, the front end. I don't know why that's an issue, but I guess it bothers Donald Trump. So he scotch tapes it. He's got two pieces of scotch tape. That seems extraordinarily cheesy for a guy who's got, uh, you know, enough money to have, you know, thousand dollar plus suits and ties and custom shirts and whatnot. No, I don't know whether he wears his off the rack ones that he sells or not. I don't know whether he personally wears those. Anyway, it's just it's weird and chintzy looking, of course, to see that it's a scotch tape together. But what it also reveals, if you if you're intimately familiar with neckties. You'll note that there's that fabric loop on the back of the outward and the the wide end of the tie, which I don't know. Nobody ever told me uh, one way or the other, but I I always want to hold those pieces of the tie together too. I use that fabric loop, and I don't know. I guess everybody probably does. I just tuck the tail end of the tie in through that, and that way they're bound together and they they stay neat. But I guess you can't do that if you tie your tie too long. And you can see this picture <laughs> where he's got the thing scotch taped. The tail end of the tie just barely reaches the loop in the back, and it wouldn't stay secure tucking that. Usually there's a good couple of inches afterwards that you could tuck it through, and it stays pretty secure. It's not going to slip apart, even in the wind. But I guess if you tie your tie... So proof that he's actually tying his ties too long... And then getting annoyed about it and uh, having to come up with a scotch tape fix. Does he dress himself? Does his butler dress him? Does he have a valet, speaking of Downton Abbey? I mean, I guess he ties those ties himself. What a blue-collar guy tying his tie himself. Uh, I will say this. It's probably it's a pretty blue-collar solution to tying your ties too long using scotch tape to hold them down, as opposed to you, you could use you know a, a fancy... Uh, pin or clip to hold that down, but uh, by gosh, he's just a, a man of the people. So I don't know. That mean, it means nothing, of course, but just it's Friday. How else are you going to pass the time? Well, okay, you could spend time 
on actual news and important stories, fine, fine. I'll take a look. Uh, there's way too many to get to anyway. Let's skim through what is uh, available to us in pocket. I've got to try and scroll down a little bit further to see if we can uh, dig a little deeper to get to the more interesting stuff here. Oh, by the way, I do have this uh, tweet from Twister Cat here that uh, says, uh, read this, read it again, read it again, read it again, read it again, read it again. Now make everyone you know read it. This is real. So I guess we better read it. This is a screenshot of a tweet storm from Elliot Lustig, who, because I'm looking at a screenshot, I can't click on his profile to tell you who he is, but maybe we can look that up afterwards. He's writes this, uh, I guess, uh, well, maybe we should go and look at this, the tweet storm itself because it looks like it's not all in here. But let's take a look at what the, the photo holds. Hannah Arendt. In her book, The Origin of Totalitarianism, provides a helpful guide for interpreting the language of fascists. And uh, i got to squint a little bit here to get into this picture, but he writes, he continues, She noted how decent liberals of 1930s Germany would fact-check the, ah, yes, fact the Nazis' bizarre claims about Jews like they were meant to be factual. What they failed to understand, Arendt suggests, is that the Nazi Jew-hating was not a statement of fact, but a declaration of intent. So when someone would blame the Jews for Germany's defeat in World War I, naive people would counter by saying, there's no evidence of that. I feel like we have said that about things. What the Nazis were doing was not describing what was true, but what would have to be true to justify what they planned to do next. Did three million, quote-unquote, illegals cast votes in the election? Clearly not. But fact-checking it is just a way of playing along with their game. Uh-oh. What Trump is saying is not that three million illegals voted. What he is saying is, I'm going to steal the voting rights of millions of Americans. Ah, well, that would be troubling and trouble, uh, a nettlesome problem, I think. Uh, there's there's some basis for that. Um well worth looking at. We'll uh, set it aside for inclusion in our roundup, and I guess I, I guess I can retweet it, and then you'll all read it and read it again. How about that? That's an even greater service to those of you following along at home. Okay. Well, uh, having noted that for the record, let me see what else we have got here. Uh, wow. Um, hmm. How can I? Uh, I had a whole plan in mind, of course. But uh, everything goes to hell in the morning, and uh, most plans collapse at that point. Let me see. There are um, a number of things that have been waiting to be included in our daily roundups here, and I want to see if I can uh, scoot back to some of them. Let's see. Uh, oh, yes. Right. One point that I failed to include in yesterday's discussion of the carrier deal, but that's very important. That first came to my attention, I think, from this, uh, another tweet storm, this one from Jim Tankersley, the economic co uh, policy correspondent for the Washington Post, according to his Twitter bio. A quick tweet storm on Trump and carrier when I should be writing stories, and I assume he then did go ahead and write this story. But... Uh, this on, uh, let's see, this would have been Wednesday afternoon. We are starting to learn more about the deal from press reports. One piece of it looks as expected, Indiana giving tax breaks to retain jobs. Well, to retain some of those jobs anyway. Presumably, this is tougher for Trump to pull off for a company not in a state currently governed by his running mate. But it's not a big shift in how governments keep jobs. It's just unusual that Trump is spearheading it. This piece, though, this piece is scarier. And he points to uh, IBJ.com International. is an international business journal. And I've got that piece, and I've got the link to the piece, and we can read it. But uh, I'll just tell you what's in the summary of it in the tweet. Uh, this, uh, quoting one of the players in the game, this is actually former Indiana Lieutenant Governor John 
Mutz, M-U-T-Z. I don't know. I doubt that he says Moots, but who knows? Uh, he's now currently chairman of the IEDC, the Economic Development Board in Indiana, and the Public Policy Committee. He says the state offered carrier incentives, but other factors really played a bigger part in their decision to leave some of the jobs in place. In fact, it was uh, something entirely different that that motivated the uh, main part of the thinking. Let's now skip over to the IBJ journal and take a look at that, although there's another... Well, maybe he sums it up in his tweet storm here. We'll continue with Tankersley for a moment. The piece that he's referring to, though, uh, like I said, it's the Indianapolis Business Journal, the IBJ. And I'll give you the link for that, and maybe we don't have to go through the whole thing. We can instead focus on what was the other factor that played the bigger role. Tankersley excerpts the piece here, and it reads, Thus, former Indiana Lieutenant Governor John Mutz, chairman of the IEDC's board, uh, of the IEDC Board's Public Policy Committee, which reviews the incentive packages offered to companies by the Economic Development Organization, said he was briefed Tuesday on the deal, which will have to be approved by the IEDC Board members. Vice President-elect Mike Pence is still technically chairman of the IEDC's board as Indiana governor. And yeah, that is weird, isn't it? Ah, look, even other people uh, noticing the, uh, why, the, the too long tie thing. I'm going to kind of retweet that one just so you can all stay up to date on this anyway uh i can tell you there will be an incentive package much told ibj on wednesday i don't know exactly the amount of money involved we will apply our formula on the rate of return to this situation it'll be judged in the same way we provide to other companies but mud said he doesn't believe the impending incentive package really is the major reason for the decision which would be kind of weird and might ordinarily be thought to undermine the claims that Trump will now be making that uh, that uh, his putting together the package is what did it here. It, it's really something else, although it may also involve Trump, which is equally troubling. OK, so what does much say is the major reason for the decision? He said that's mostly likely, most likely because the carrier corporation's parent company, United Technologies Corporation, desires to keep its hefty federal contracts. United Technologies and its subsidiaries collect about $6 billion annually from U.S. government contracts, making up about 10% of its overall revenue, according to CNN Money. By the way, anybody else getting 10% of their overall revenue from the federal government would be probably called the welfare queen if they, uh, well, if they had the skin color for it. You know how that game goes. But if they're, if they're white, they're just uh, taking advantage of what's out there. You know, just following the rules. They're smart. Comparatively, the company, uh, UT, that is, uh, expects to save about $65 million per year by moving its local plant, IBJ reported earlier this year. United Technologies is a gigantic international company with many different divisions and subsidiaries, many of which do substantial amounts of business with the U.S. government, Mutz said. The dynamics are considerably different than they were even before this election. You're talking here about a company that is trying to be competitive and also wants to keep their business with the government. So Tankersley continues here in the seventh of his series of tweets. To paraphrase Walter Sobchak, this is not NAM, N-A-M, it's Federal Procurement. There are no rules. Uh, uh, so, okay, uh, here we go. Now I'm catching on to what that actually means. Ding, lights going on. The idea that a president can implicitly or explicitly threaten contracts over an unrelated matter is not normal. If this Indiana official is correct, and that's what went down with Carrier, then, wow, I guess something really major is in fact going on here. That number 10 of the tweets then we are already pretty far down the government intervention scale I lay out here. And then he points to his own Washington Post piece entitled The Huge Unanswered Questions About Trump's Deal to Save Indiana Jobs. Will conservatives tolerate this? Will liberals, will the business community, especially the big business lobby groups? 
Very important disclaimer, Tankersley adds. It's fantastic that those jobs are staying here, those that are anyway, especially for those workers and families. Questions about the terms of keeping those jobs can and should come from the standpoint of what policies would best save or create the most jobs. Last point, he says here, if no pressure was in fact applied explicitly or implicitly on contracts, then that would be very good. Changes the equation a lot, which is why it's so important to get a full public accounting of the deal, what's in it and how it went down. In other words, he's saying, what if the deal is, and uh, I guess Trump can still claim credit for it, even if he, even if the package that he put together isn't the reason or the major reason that Carrier agreed to leave some jobs behind, uh, he could still claim credit for saying, yeah, I implicitly threatened them and said, you guys make $65 billion a year in government contracts. If you up and move, well, then I don't know how much of that money you're going to make in the future in government contracts. But government contracting is supposed to be a place where elected officials are hands off. They're including the president, not supposed to weigh in on those things. They're supposed to be awarded on the basis of, well, what we'll call merit. Now, I don't think anybody believes that that's the only factor at play anymore. And there's lots of playing around in the gray areas of uh, you know, am I weighing in on this thing or am I not? Um, also, of course, there, there's a lot of weighing in on it anyway, and uh, I guess from the congressional standpoint, uh, that, that that poses an interesting question. I mean, congressional offices claim all the time to be meddling in issues of contracting. This is here's an interesting paradox for you. In our in, in government contracting and procurement, the decision making is not supposed to be in elected political hands. It's made by, well, it begins the process of being made at the staff level, the career non-political staff level in the departments that administer the grants or the contracts. And they get bumped up eventually and they pass through the hands of political appointees who, uh, if they're smart, do their best to stay away from meddling in ways that could be picked up on by the press as political meddling. And, you know, typically speaking, your low bidder or whatever gets the, gets the contract and, uh, and it works the way you were told it was going to work with a little bit of showboating going on along the way. What do I mean by this? I, and, and I say that the showboating in terms of, uh, or I, I describe, I use that term to describe what happens in the political elected offices in Congress. If you are in the district or even the state very often of the, uh, 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 well, what you do, I mean, you're, you're a contractor and you're, you have at stake $65 million or, you know, whatever, a $1 million contract a billion-dollar contract with the government, you contact your members of Congress, your senators, your congressperson, and maybe the entire delegation, if you're a, if it's a big enough contract and you employ people all over the state, and you tell them that you're up for this contract and you want a letter of support to the department of whatever is handing out the contract on this thing, uh, saying that you're a good guy and that you ought to get the contract, like uh, Steve Mnuchin did with the people that uh, the bank that One West gave donations to, right? You, you basically want to fill the record with uh, written support for your for your bid and for your fitness for fulfilling the contract, etc. And congressional offices are only too happy to provide this, even though, I mean, strictly speaking, looking at it. Uh, objectively, that would be considered uh, elected officials meddling in the system. I see they've chosen this time to uh, mow the grass and or blow leaves outside the windows of Kegro in the Morning World headquarters. I wonder if you can hear that. I hope not. And if, if you can, then maybe you'll think of it as a pleasant background fall, late fall uh, background noise. Anyway, uh, so, but members of Congress write these letters routinely, and they do so knowing that it looks like political interference, but also knowing 
that the trained personnel on the other end, the job of the professionals on the other end in the department of whatever department is granting this contract, the protocol is you take those letters in and you say, that's nice, and you stamp them received, and you put them in a file, and you stick them in the back of the file of that uh, contractor's bid, and then you don't look at them. Occasionally, though, we were always admonished, do make sure that you send these letters and that you send copies of these letters back to the contractors because they want to see that we're doing everything we can to help them, even though the game is not to let these things help. But if you don't write it, then it looks like you didn't care, and they tell everybody that you weren't trying to help them get the job and blah, 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 and you suffer all the political ramifications of that. Never mind. At no point do you ever suffer the, suffer the political ramifications of, of going out of your way ineffectively uh, and effectually, as it, it may be, to interfere with things. That, that repercussion never comes to rest on you for some reason. Anyway, so there you go. You uh, hand out copies of the letter, and uh, I guess occasionally it's possible that over on the uh, departmental side they may say, Eh, this is weird. We got a guy in here for a bid on a very large federal contract, and none of the members of that guy's congressional delegation have written in support. I know we're supposed to ignore all those letters anyway, but the fact that none have even come in, the pro forma, yeah, this is a decent company, what does that mean? And I don't know whether any, I, I don't have any personal experience with that, and I don't know how a department might react to that. They may ignore it and say, well, we're supposed to ignore it in the first place, so let's ignore it anyway. Or they may not. They may say, well, you know, all things being equal, as between these two equal bids, maybe we should go with the one with congressional support. And every congressional office is afraid of that happening, so uh, so they avoid the problem by simply saying, uh, all right, well, we'll write the letter, even though we know it's not supposed to do anything. But that was always a big Part, that was a lot of what we did. Uh, it took up a lot of staff time in, uh, in, in congressional offices. You know, not, not the majority of what you did, but it was a big part of your time there, usually somebody's job to, uh, generate these letters. Luckily, you know, it took about 30 seconds to figure out what to put in the letter, but, you know, it was a process you had to go through. And every, all, the whole while, everybody was wink, wink. We know these things don't make a difference, except they might make a difference in their absence, whether a political difference at home or possibly, I guess, a decision-making difference anyway. And either, either way, you don't want to risk it. So you write these letters, even though the letters, objectively speaking, do exactly the sort of thing that you're not supposed to do with federal contracts. Anyway, instead, Trump, the rule breaker and red tape cutter, bypasses all of that and says, I am going to threaten to weigh in on on and meddle with federal contracting and uh, the bidding process to punish you if you move these jobs overseas. And so, but you know, even so, the result, the upshot of the deal is still what it is. Two-thirds of the jobs are gone, and that's that. Whether or not they suffer in contracting, I guess, remains to be seen. And uh, although uh, I think Trump reads the politics of it probably pretty well, in that, uh, what do you want to bet that not very many people will have a lot to say if United Technologies begins to lose contracts and Trump begins to say, yeah, that's because they moved 2,000 jobs out of the country. Like, who's going to say, I demand that you give those contracts back to United Technologies? Probably no one. Not even the Democrats in staunch opposition, not even the good government types in staunch opposition to him. They're, they're just, uh, there's no winning on that side of the equation. So, my guess is, that's where we'll see that come. To, we'll see uh, not much come of that, uh, except perhaps among libertarian economic journals. I don't know. Well, that wasn't exactly what I expected to spend the bulk of the time on, but uh, I was happy to do it. That was an important part of things that we didn't really cover yesterday. But that's just uh, that's the nature of the beast. It's a everything's complicated. Speaking of everything being complicated. 
maybe this would be a good time to uh, discuss a little bit of this. Although we are waiting, uh, are expecting to hear from Josie Duffy Rice uh, at some point during the morning. And I guess I better check and make sure I haven't uh, gotten any strange email messages or desperate requests for uh, what time should I come on. Because we usually just leave it open for you. Whenever you're ready, uh, you, you call in and uh, and we... We take our minds sometimes off of Donald Trump. Although, again, I will remind you, as I did in the morning post, she's got a lot to say about the post-election situation and our consideration of Donald Trump. And uh, we did have at least, as I mentioned yesterday, at least one listener say that uh, we ought to make a point of highlighting what she has had to say in her latest highly recommended diary in which she is prevailing upon those of us on the progressive side of things to, uh, well, uh, maybe do maybe a little less, maybe stop the uh, tut-tutting at people and uh, over getting distracted or allowing themselves to think that they're becoming distracted by this or that that uh, Donald Trump does. I myself... Uh, I'm a big fan of getting distracted. And uh, although it sounds like a really savvy thing to tell people, don't pay attention to this. He's really doing that. But that, that I don't know. seems to me like, uh, well, one, uh, there's a thousand conflicting viewpoints about what that thing is that we should be focusing on instead of X and X changes. Sometimes it's his tweets. Sometimes it's his rallies. Sometimes it's this policy or that policy. Uh but uh, I'm a big fan of leaving things open for us to consider all possible options. So I think I'm with Josie on that one. But the, the suggestion came in from a listener uh, that we ought to have Josie discuss this with Greg because this particular listener, and I have to scroll back and see if I can find the tweet so we can credit it, but basically thought, oh, you know, uh, Greg has uh, uh, read to us from a number of don't get distracted type Articles and our uh, listener here thinks that maybe he's perhaps uh, 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 doing a little bit too much of that and ought to be uh, listening to Josie on this. But I suspect that there wouldn't be much in the way of sparring on that. I suspect that you would find that the uh, throwaway line really of don't get distracted by X is uh, a lot more flexible than you think. And it would be probably pretty easy for any of us to convince another of us that uh, that thing isn't really that much of a distraction, but some other things really are. But, you know, just as with all of these situations, it's pretty vague and you can't always nail down exactly which ones fit under the definition I'm currently using of what's a distraction and what doesn't. All right, well, that tweet doesn't come immediately to my eye, so we'll move on from there. Uh, but it might be a good time at this point if i can find my i had a nice piece set aside a rather major piece from huffington post which i don't even uh, i have my doubts about whether or not it would be something we could get through today but i would suggest it for your own edification at the very least over the weekend uh now i'm searching for it because pocket is a mess as usual here we are um Doing some excellent work, as usual, the political reporters over at Huffington Post, really the best division Huffington Post uh, has ever had going for it, if you ask me. And uh, they are, uh, th- this is remarkable for a number of reasons, so not the least of which is has revealing, millions of you know, dollars the in insider game of how things work in Congress. And you know how much we love to spend time on that. Here, so I've got some auto-playing video in it, of course, and I have to make sure that it does minimum interference. Sam Stein, Ryan Grimm, Matt Fuller, on this piece, covering some lame duck activity that is, in fact, extraordinarily revealing. Congress is about to pass a bill that shows D.C. at its worst. It may also turn around the opioid crisis and cure cancer. What at its worst? And then do those things? How could that be? The 21st Century Cures Act has some incredible upsides to go along with a shady underbelly. There's a reason lawmakers both love and hate it. Short, long story made short, the hater here is Elizabeth Warren. So you might 
uh, either be inclined to side with her, as is often the case, or scratch your head and say, what problem could Elizabeth Warren have with a bill that would address the opioid crisis and possibly incentivize the search for a cure for cancer? Well, that's Washington for you. Let's get through as much of this as we can, and then I'll include it in the roundup. I recommend that you read the rest if we don't get to it. Uh, but I'll happily interrupt it for Josie when she's ready because we haven't heard from her in a while and it's about time. In 1996, Purdue Pharma introduced a new painkiller it said carried a low risk of abuse or addiction. It called the drug OxyContin. You likely know the story behind that. In reality, of course, OxyContin was extremely addictive and Purdue knew it. A decade later, three Purdue executives and the company itself pleaded guilty to criminal charges tied to OxyContin's marketing and agreed to pay, because why go to jail when you can pay, more than $600 million in fines. But the executives dodged prison time, as execs often do, and the prosecution did little to slow the rise of opioid use. The pharmaceutical industry had spent the last 10 years and billions of dollars pushing the medical community to ramp up the use of OxyContin and other opioids. By December, oh, I'm sorry, by 2013, the number of annual opioid prescriptions, including short-term and multiple, had nearly tripled, topping 200 million in a country of just over 300 million people. It's more OxyContin prescriptions than guns, or gun owners, anyway. Use of OxyContin, sometimes the same people, and other opioids grew to crisis levels as federal and state governments cracked down on docs who dispensed pills and prescriptions indiscriminately. Users turned to heroin instead. Four out of five new heroin users started out by abusing prescription painkillers. The temptation to go to the uh, the old Trident gum formulation is overwhelming. The results have devastated and overwhelmed first responders and an ill-equipped and ideologically hidebound treatment system. From 2010 to 2012, heroin overdose rates doubled in 28 states, according to 2014 CDC report, and in 2014, more than 28,000 Americans died of opioid overdoses, an all-time high, according to the agency. There's no reason to think the death rate has slowed since then, at all by way of background. But there's a complication. Instead of cracking down on the pharmaceutical companies that fueled the boom in opioid abuse, lawmakers are rewarding the industry. What? No health care-related bill of this size could move through Congress without the support of Big Pharma. I see what's beginning to happen here, and so are you. The authors of the 21st Century Cures Act earned the industry's support by including regulatory rollbacks that drug makers have long sought and creating cheaper and quicker paths for drug approval by reducing safeguards. It's as if the fire department had to pay off the arsonist to get permission to put out a fire. Although I wonder, I mean... There's a lot at stake and a lot of dynamics, of course, here that uh, uh, haven't yet been explained. Although, you know, you do tend to wonder, well, why would the pharma industry would, I mean, they would lobby against it behind the scenes, but wouldn't, would they not find themselves in a difficult position publicly if the bill was simply, hey, we're combating opioid abuse here? That doesn't mean, you should not be, it's disgusting for you to be seen in public viewing this as it's going to hurt my sales as opposed to certainly you are against the abuse of your product are you not isn't everybody okay i guess they couldn't get them to behave that well lawmakers have been left then with a hobson's choice the bill would make billions of dollars available for medical research it would fund lofty goals such as a such as precision medicine a white house initiative to map the human brain and vice president joe biden's cancer moonshot it would save lives or i guess it could potentially anyway right but it would also undermine regulations that patient advocacy groups say are essential for making sure medical and drug research is conducted ethically and safely meaning it could cost lives too in other words in addition to just short circuiting the research uh, arm or the research uh, um, phase of things, uh, I mean, I guess it can just enable another OxyContin boom, right? Or the, if the regulations get rolled back and you can know that, I mean, if under the old regulations, you can know that your drug is highly addicting and market it as though it isn't, I guess with less regulation, we should only expect that to get worse. I'll continue with the article. Some politicians think the choice is clear. 
On Monday evening, Senator Elizabeth Warren denounced the measure in aggressive terms, calling it the result of corruption, fighting words on the Senate floor, and singling out Republican Majority Leader Mitch McConnell of Kentucky for taking millions from a donor with an interest in the bill's passage. Warren was hoping to make a battle around the Cures Act the moment that Democrats announced in the wake of Donald Trump's election that they were standing up and fighting against a broken and corrupt system. The American people don't give Democrats majority support so we can come back to Washington and play dead, she said on the floor. They didn't send us here to whimper, whine, or grovel. Now they're watching, waiting, and hoping, hoping we show some spine and start fighting back when Congress completely ignores the message of the American people and returns to all its same old ways. But... Others have read the politics around the bill differently. Senator Johnny Isaacson, Republican of Georgia, one of the bill's supporters, called Warren's floor speech the most irresponsible statement anybody can possibly make, adding she pontificates as if she knows everything, when in fact she knows nothing. How can you say that about Elizabeth Warren, right? Isaacson and his allies will probably win. After the House's fast-track vote on Wednesday, the bill will be taken up by the Senate next week, where it has significant bipartisan support. Unless Warren and her progressive allies make inroads, that is, the Obama administration formally announced its strong support on Tuesday evening. It's extremely likely to become law. How do we reconcile this? But I like Obama, but I like Warren, but I like them both. It's not that simple, and it never is. The debate surrounding the 21st century... Cures Act has come to embody a larger dispute about how government can and should operate. And that's going to be a big question going forward under the Trump administration. Some 1,455 lobbyists acting on behalf of more than 400 companies and other organizations have lobbied on the legislation, according to the Center for Responsive Politics. Over the past year and a half, companies who disclosed they lobbied on the Cures Act spent half a billion dollars to influence Congress, the resulting bill is packed with politicians, pet projects, and sops to industry, as is often the case. The 2016 election, like everyone prior, was run on a promise to change this sort of legislating, to, tra- to drain the swamp, whatever that might still mean. But those pledges, like ones before, will come in conflict with how Washington actually works by blending good motives, bad compromises, and giveaways to interest groups, and holding your nose as you vote on the result. That is largely how things do tend to work. Representative Fred Upton, the Michigan Republican who chairs the House Energy and Commerce Committee, became convinced of the need for a cures-type bill in 2011 after he met Brooke and Brielle Kennedy, two sisters, ages 8 and 9, respectively, with spinal muscular atrophy, a rare disease that destroys the nerves that control voluntary muscle movement. I remember... When they first came to my office in Kalamazoo, Upton told the Huffington Post on Tuesday night, I said, what's your name? One of the girls answered that she was Cinderella and told Upton that her sister was Sleeping Beauty. So that's who they've always been, those two, Upton said. But whether it's that or whether it's uh, Duchenne, uh, I guess another uh, malady, uh, that doesn't ring a bell to me, but certainly uh, Greg would know it. Whether it's Alzheimer's, diabetes, lupus, cancer. I mean, we're all impacted by these things. It's a, uh, okay, I'll agree. We're all impacted by disease. Gabe Griffin, an 11-year-old with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, became another inspiration for the bill, as did Upton's family members. This is often the case with the Republicans. His wife has lupus and autoimmune disease, and his mother is a cancer survivor, and his father has diabetes. I'm no different than anybody else, Upton said. We all have those stories. When Upton set out to craft the bill to help people like Griffin and the Kennedy sisters in December 2013, he knew he had to balance certain interests. Lots of politicians were pushing for more government funding for biomedical research, but Republicans didn't want to raise taxes to pay for it and argued the same result could be achieved by cutting regulatory red tape. The congressman saw an opportunity for a bargain in which both sides could get what they wanted. Hmm. In December 2013, he partnered with Democrat Diana DeJetti of Colorado, to begin painstakingly assembling draft legislation. They, in turn, worked with the chairman and ranking Democrat on the Senate Health Committee, Senators Lamar Alexander and Patty Murray. Upton and DeJetti pulled together, pulled together language from proposals intended to bring to market much-needed medical therapies that weren't economically viable 
and from bills to stimulate investment in new infectious disease remedies. They added measures tinkering with the FDA's approval processes and streamlining clinical trials. They proposed the creation of an administrative working group to address the hurdles scientists face when applying for federal research grants. Most important, at a time when Congress was pinching every penny, the bill found revenue sources to fund more research. Upton and DeJetty's draft legislation devoted $8.75 billion to the National Institutes of Health and $550 million to the FDA over a five-year period, offset by selling oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve and cuts to the payments Medicare and Medicaid make to states, insurance companies, and providers. Okay, so now you got people interested and worried. In April 2015, after eight hearings, 24 roundtable discussions, and several white papers, the bipartisan pair released a discussion draft. The formal bill passed through committee by a 51-0 to vote in May. In July of that year, the full House approved the bill by a vote of 344 to 77. Pharma... The, uh, the organization, that is, United for Medical Research, Newt Gingrich, and Katie Couric all applauded its passage. That's a broad coalition. House and Senate supporters of the legislation were working out the differences between their bills well before the Senate actually passed its own version, but the Senate was the Senate, slow to act. By the time the chamber took up the bill at the beginning of 2016, Congress had already used a chunk of Upton and DeJetty's funding sources on other things forcing lawmakers to find new ways to pay for their bill or decrease its cost. They decreased its cost, bringing funding for the NIH from $8.75 billion over five years down to $4.8 billion over ten years. At the urging of Senator of Zarner, Representative Paul Ryan, the Speaker, who became House Speaker after the bill passed that chamber, they also changed the funding from mandatory spending, which is paid out automatically unless Congress votes to change it, to discretionary spending, which lawmakers have to vote to spend each year, which means it would be available for cutting later on. For biomedical research advocates, this shift complicated the part of the legislation that they actually loved. The NIH's budget has grown slightly since taking a major hit in 2013 from just over $30 billion in 2014 to $31.3 billion in 2016, but funding isn't keeping up with inflation, and other countries are increasing the amount they spend on medical research at a much higher rate. An infusion of $4.8 billion isn't anything to take lightly, said one senior official for a biomedical research advocacy group, but by making the funding discretionary, the lawmakers also endangered it. Congress, for example, could decide to fund NIH at a lower level next year by arguing that the funding made available from the 21st Century's Cure Act justifies the cut. Congress can also choose to raid the $4.8 billion in NIH funding for unrelated purposes, fighting the next infectious disease outbreak, for example, or uh, invading someplace that won't give Trump a construction permit, for that matter. And then there is the matter of the incoming president, Trump, who has promised to take advantage of low interest rates and borrow to invest in research and infrastructure but whose commitment to science is not exactly sterling. Two Democratic senators said they spoke to Michael Botticelli, the uh, director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy, about concerns that Trump might not spend the opioid-related money for its stated purposes. He assured them that he could get the money out the door and to the states before Trump takes office on January 20th. It would be a bureaucratic feat, but if anybody can do it, he can do it, said Senator Gene Shaheen. So he's got a backer there. Still, believing that lawmakers and bureaucrats will keep their promises requires an awful lot of putting faith in the process. That's an awkward construction, but okay. A second medical research advocate told Huffington Post, and faith is not a sound foundation for science. Biomedical research relies instead on stability and science, for that matter. Grants are awarded over several years, and if a grant-awarding agency is worried that its funding pool might shift or dry up, the type of research it funds will be shorter-term investments. I am concerned that we're talking about $6 billion in offsets and of cuts for only one year of guaranteed funding, Senator Bob Menendez told the Huffington Post. 
I don't know that I want to give the Republican majority $6 billion in cuts when I have only one year in funding. Republicans on Capitol Hill say they understand and recognize the worry about discretionary spending for the bill's initiatives, but they argued it's overblown. As the congressional GOP aide noted, even mandatory funding isn't guaranteed because no Congress can bind a future Congress. Well, far more important, he added, was that the research priorities funded by the 21st Century's Cures Act enjoyed seemingly unshakable bipartisan support. At the moment, anyway. The concern is like saying, okay, you won the lottery, but are you going to spend the money? The GOP aide said, everyone spends the money. Mm. But on what? The aide has a point. Despite their concerns about the vulnerability of discretionary spending, most medical research advocacy groups support the bill. Many people in Washington are coming to the same conclusion as the medical research advocates. The bill's far from perfect, but it includes something for just about everyone. Its authors designed it that way. In the legislation's earliest forms, for example, some Republicans worried the NIH funding was akin to signing a blank check for the administration. But the bill's backers recognized that if they took too much money out, they'd lose Democratic support. They came up with a workaround. Alexander, after a meeting with Upton and White House officials, suggested targeting most of the money at three or four specific projects that could use a cash infusion. They settled on the Brain Mapping Program and the Precision Medicine Initiative, which is designed to track how factors like lifestyle, wealth, and even environmental variables affect diseases. And they included a parting gift for Biden, $1.8 billion for the National Cancer Moonshot. Biden lost his son Beau to brain cancer in May 2015, and when he announced in an emotional Rose Garden statement in October of that year that he would pass a, on a run for president, he expressed the desire to make an absolute national commitment to end cancer as we know it today. Obama formally unveiled the moonshot campaign in his 2016 State of the Union address when he declared it as ambitious as sending a man to the moon, hence the name. He tapped the VP to lead that effort. For the rest of the year, Biden met with physicians, researchers, families, tech leaders, and even Pope Francis to come up with the best ways to put government money to use to accelerate cancer research, prevention, and detection. So far, he has singled out efforts to make it easier for patients to get into clinical trials and push for even more open data and collaboration between researchers. The vice president submitted his final report to Obama last month, outlining what his team accomplished over the year and offering a five-year plan to unite and marshal every resource of the federal government. And according to sources, he's now calling his friends in the Senate making a passionate case on behalf of the cancer research funding contained in this bill. A lot of them, the Democrats, see this as a sort of a last thing for Biden, one Democratic staffer told Huffington Post, but if he weren't pushing for it, it would probably fail. The aide said, speaking anonymously to offer candid insights, Senator Chris Coons, a Democrat from Biden's home state of Delaware, said Biden's appeal to him was decisive. Perhaps the increase in spending on opioid prevention and reduction and the increase in spending on treatments and cures is dwarfed by the cuts, but I've heard from the vice president, who feels very strongly that this is an important next step in the fight against cancer, Kuhn said. Money for Biden's cancer moonshot was the largest carrot meant to maintain support for the bill, but it was not the only one. The first two parts of the legislation include a host of intriguing funding initiatives of programmatic changes. There is a Eureka Prize competition, Ensuring useful research expenditures is key for Alzheimer's Act. Get it? Eureka. That directs the NIH to establish a competition for innovative work to combat serious biomedical diseases. There are requirements for the Institute to support opportunities for young researchers, a main problem in the field of science where funding tends to go to established names. And there are even sections designed to support the National Pediatric Research Network and accelerate therapies and preventions for tick-borne diseases. There's your Lyme folks working hard again. But assembling a broad bipartisan coalition often requires, including ethically suspect giveaways. And this bill has those, too. The bill incorporates ideas from the so-called Regrow Act, Reliable and Effective Growth for Regenerative Health Options that Improve Wellness. <laughs> That is some mishmash. Uh, introduced by Senator Mark Kirk, now out, of course, and co-sponsored by Senators Susan Collins and Joe Manchin. Hmm, that's some collection. 
While the language of regrow and cures are different, the driving idea is the same. Both bills speed up the delivery of adult stem cell therapies to patients by allowing those therapies to go to market before they're definitively proved to be safe and effective. Mm. Such a strategy would negatively impact the development of stem cell therapies, the integrity of emerging, emerging regenerative medicine market, and the health and safety of people using stem cell products. So warns the International Society for Stem Cell Research, a coalition of medical researchers, in December. Regrow was backed by a range of stem cell companies and patient support groups. They do have some aligning interests there. But its most important backer is W. Ed Bosarge, I guess is how you would read that, a super wealthy Texas entrepreneur who made huge contributions to the Senate Leadership Fund, the super PAC linked to Mitch McConnell in the 2016 election cycle. Bosarge, who runs the stem cell firm Bosarge Life Sciences, gave $3 million through the company Petrodome Energy LLC, an oil and gas business he operates, stem cells and oil. Hmm. As of October 19th, the most recent date for such disclosures, these contributions made him the fourth largest supporter of McConnell's successful effort to keep the Senate in Republican hands. Ah, we'll depart here from the story, which I do recommend to you to pick up for Josie here. Hi, how are hey, you? Okay, how you doing? Good. Uh, good. It's good to hear from you again. I, I know it's yeah. been a rough post-election period. Yeah, uh, I know for everyone. And uh, but uh, yeah, just taking a few moments to remind everybody, Congress still working, uh, believe it or not. <laughs> and so uh, I recommend to everybody uh, skimming over the the ending of the Huffington Post story just to see. Uh, we'll discuss it, I'm sure, a little bit more next week, just because it's uh, it's a great look inside the horse trading that goes on in almost every piece of major legislation. But I do want to shift now uh, to uh, bring you back into the show. I know we've, uh, have we caught up? We did catch up uh, post-election at least once yeah. on who had won in some of those uh, uh, DA races that you were highlighting. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's been, you know, obviously, uh, I think we talked the day that Sessions got nominated. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, local criminal justice stuff has been pretty slow in terms of news obviously a lot of focus is yeah, on hard to break what we're this facing yeah. yeah uh yeah so a lot of, a lot of well uh, when national news is this nutty it's hard to break through sometimes on on the local level but uh right, right. Well, but you know i think you um i had something i i wanted to talk about yes. today with you which um i think is just an interesting theory that we should keep in mind Next year, 2018 and, uh, and beyond, which is that, um, we're, we're facing kind of a weird moment. You know, a year ago, bipartisan criminal justice reform on the federal level looked pretty much in the bag. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it was, it was a real victory for people who had, um, spent years working on this issue. And it was a real victory because there were conservatives who were driving, um, this reform. I mean, really, like, you know, people that, like, um, are just generally kind of intolerable. We're really fighting for this reform. And then Trump came along and he was the only Republican nominee really to say like law and order, let's bring back the, you know, let's bring mm, yes. back high prosecution. Let's, let's bring back, let's put people in prison, you know, um, even more. He's kind of in the minority on the right in this, at least in, um, in, in kind of Washington, um, in this, in this, um, approach to criminal justice and, now that he's won, that threatens to kind of set back um, the, the reform movement pretty significantly, um, even though he, he's not going to have a lot of power in terms of what he can actually do. Um, the Not enforcing things via the DOJ is a big deal. Jeff Sessions' rhetoric is a big deal. I mean, this is who kind of controls the national narrative. That being said, um, like I said when we talked last time, we won a lot of races. Um, prosecutor races uh, on election day. I mean, it was a small silver lining and a very, very dark um, day overall. And I think what that says is that there's an opportunity for progressives to build around criminal justice reform in places like the Rust Belt. You know, um, if that's who mm. we're trying to win, we can we can have a real conversation about um, 
of kind of convincing people that the Democratic Party is better for them by using criminal justice reform. I really do think that, you know, this, these are places in Pennsylvania and Michigan and Ohio um, in Wisconsin, you know, my parents are, are from, uh, my dad's from Toledo, Ohio. My mom's from the Midwest as well. I, you know, um, these are places where addiction problems are really, really, really prevalent, right? Yes. Opioid addiction. Mm-hmm. People have, you know, even it, the rates aren't as high as they are, for example, in, in, um, poor black neighborhoods, but, Still, in a lot of working class, quote unquote, working class white neighborhoods, that's kind of the euphemism we're using these days for those voters. Um, um, there's still a pretty high rate of um, criminal justice involvement, you know, and that and that's that traps you when you think about trying to get a job, trying to get benefits, trying to keep custody of your child, um, trying to get housing, uh, and and that and that people are having a hard job just generally economically. A lot of that is influenced by kind of the, the problems that the criminal justice system creates for people in it. And I think um, it it's an opportunity for the left to to understand that about what it must be like in some ways um, l- having a criminal record and how many people in America live that kind of have that, you know, burden on them um, constantly or, or, or carrying that. that are bearing that cross. So, I mean, mm. I would say the other, um, the other thought here is like, it's just so crazy, right? I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm sure you've talked about this plenty, but the Republicans are supposed to be the party of small government. <laughs> uh, yes. It's insane, right? It's just really crazy to think about the idea that we just elected someone who pr- kind of projects this more big government rhetoric than, than, um, anyone unless it comes to government helping you. Um, and uh, this is actually an example of that. Bringing back l- quote unquote law and order is is not supported by, I mean, I'm sure everybody will be surprised to know that something Donald Trump said is not supported by reality or facts, okay. but Oops. this is a, on that long list. Um, and it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, a you know, an overly powerful state bearing down on communities, punishing them for things and equally, um, disproportionately and, um, without accountability. And that's not what we want. And I think it's time for progressives to say, listen, it's not as, you know, the big government, small government dichotomy is just not reflective of reality. Um, and, and, and what's happening on the ground. And if you don't want big government, you, you need to fight for criminal justice reform um, and I, I think it's a, a way that the Democrats can kind of build on the local level and hopefully um, uh, not have to go through what we went through three weeks ago ever again. Hmm. Well, it's an interesting uh, avenue for inroads and, and not at the top of a lot of lists in terms of discussion among national pundits that I can see. And, and, and it's not that they're unfamiliar with the subject either. Right. Hmm. I think that part of that is because is maybe a good thing, um, because I, I, it's a little bit like, how much do you want to do we want to show our hand yet? Um, hmm. Not that like it's a secret, but you know there there's probably something to be said for not shifting Republicans all their attention to this right away, um, although they obviously don't need to either. Um, but I I think the other reason. It's not, you know, that, that, that connection maybe hasn't totally been made yet. And that criminal justice reform to, it's really interesting to some people, but it's not interesting to everybody in part because it doesn't feel like it could be you. Um, Mm. and, and I, and I, and I'm familiar with that feeling, you know, working in this, um, you know, on this issue and expecting to work on it my whole life. I have a lot of, um, sympathy, but I didn't really have any fear until November 8th in the same way. I don't live a life of feeling like I could be going to prison at any second for something I didn't do. Um, I, I don't, I, I, I'm a like much, I'm, I don't fall in the categories of people who, um, suffer from that, uh, reality. And, um, I'm, I'm lucky because of that. And now, you know, I think that journalists are scared. I think activists are scared. I think that, um, you know, a vindictive Trump administration, um, 
could result in um, journalists going to prison or um, going bankrupt or um, having to live in kind of a, a you know, Putin style fear state mm. um, or something maybe not as bad, but something, a variation on that. And yeah. uh, maybe it's time for us to sort of say this feeling that a lot of you ha- you are having right now, a lot of people have had a feeling like this for a long time. And True. that's why you have to fight the system now, right? You have to fight it when it's not you so that the norms, you know, it, it's scary to have to live in America that has more people in prison than any other nation in the world. 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's prison population. And then put a, a potential autocrat in, 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 in power. Right. Yeah. I mean, to- the system, is, he's, he has the infrastructure. He has, mm-hmm. the, we've made it a norm to put people in prison. Um, yes. and, and, uh, if we could fight back on that, um, you know, if we can use that as a way to kind of fight back and let people know that it's not safety to put everybody in prison. It's safety to, to not, to, to not have that be the norm because, because he has a lot of power and that's one fight he doesn't have to fight. Yeah. And to have, uh, to, to enter into the fight with, as you said, the, some of the highest percentage of, uh, of the population in prison in the in the Western world, and and then of course have the reins grabbed by someone who campaigned on putting more in, for for any reason. I mean, uh, and it could be anything. And and as you as you pointed out, I guess this is the beginning of a new era in which uh, you know if you never necessarily thought it was going to be you imprisoned either for something you didn't do or for something that wasn't your fault in some way and and you realize that you, you now may fall into that category because things that weren't illegal before that you are doing simply become illegal right right exactly, uh, exactly. yeah well how do you how do you deal with something like that all right well that hmm. that's that scary does right <laughs> it does it's, it is it's, it's scary for you it's scary for the, i think the entire sort of uh, you're right yeah and and it's funny because, I mean, Bush got elected when I was 13, so I don't think that I have the exact um, oh, uh, okay. reference point. Um, but the fear of a, con- a very conservative next eight years is not that um, is not th- the big thing to me. The big mm. thing is what happens when all of these norms that we see as static and kind of unmovable. Uh, checks and balances, you know, SCOTUS keeping the executive power um, in check, um, no political prosecutions, a healthy democracy, all these things that like have been eroding. I don't know if they were ever that solid. Certainly the ideas were solid. They've been kind of eroding for some time. Um, And we are facing um, a reality, a world where, I mean, we've all read the articles, right? Like this, this, is not, these are not guaranteed to us. They're not guaranteed to us unless, um, if we, if people in power don't recognize them. And that's, that's really scary because who's to say, um, that, um, we're not next, you know? Well, we did get a little bit of a taste of that even during the Bush administration in, in smaller ways even if right. it was just a matter of well uh you know federal agents surveilling the meetings of quaker right. peace advocates during right. the uh during the uh the Iraq war right uh and, and in ways that they refused to infiltrate or monitor right wing militias and hate groups that have turned out to be perpetrating exactly. uh domestic terrorism in the years since right exactly. yes uh, so easy to see how, uh, you know, even just an incremental change uh, in, in fr- a, st- a small step up from where the Bush administration left us would, uh, well, would, would create enormous difficulties. And, of course, there are advocates who have pointed out along the way that uh, the Obama administration didn't do as much as we ought to have expected of them in ratcheting that back. But ratcheting right. federal power back is something that doesn't happen. Right. And it certainly... Um, you know, I I love uh, Obama, and I have been thinking a lot these past three weeks about how maybe um, 
we should have been more critical about some of his expansions of power. When you trust the person in power, it feels okay. Yeah. And then when you don't, it feel you all of a sudden wish that like you had stuck a little bit closer to the, to the margins. Um, one quick thing I'll say, and I think we, we've talked about this before. Maybe we haven't, but I wrote something a couple months ago about slaps, um, mm. which I don't know if you've ever talked about on here, but um, strategic lawsuits against public participation. And these are the lawsuits that kind of Donald Trump uses to shut people up. Mm. Um, and he has, um, so you right. should, you should look these up. S S L A P P um, like slap with an extra P yes. and um, they are he when he, when someone sued him for against Trump University, the first person to file a lawsuit and kind of build out the um, the class action, uh, he um, sued them right back uh, for for a ton of money. Just because what that does is it makes it so now you have to fight that lawsuit and try to bring your own lawsuit. And if you don't have the resources, you give up, right? right? Yeah. And you see it all the time. I mean, you see people, you know, people on Yelp get a bad review. Companies on Yelp get a bad review and they sue the reviewer. OK, mm -hmm. they um, we have we have stories of uh, um, people suing nursing, suing people for talking to their lawyer, saying it's defamation, con private conversation between someone and their lawyer. I mean, really, really kind of extreme stuff. And I'm going to keep kind of following this issue. But uh, there's a federal law that's going to be. Um, that's kind of been pending for some time and hearings happened last May and we'll see what happens this next session. But I suggest that everybody, uh, uh, look it up and we should, and that's something that we should focus on because we do want to create protections for people who, um, yes. who, uh, bring lawsuits against more, the more powerful. Send me the uh, link for that piece. I will. If you can dig it up and I'll uh, include it in the roundup. Great. For sure. I, that's a, that's an angle on things that we haven't explored much. Yeah, but I mean, the fact that it's a favorite tool of Donald Trump, who, you know, will no longer necessarily be in a position to do so from a private standpoint, but maybe yeah. it's even worse. He can now bring the resources of the Fed. Does the federal, has the federal government ever found itself filing slap suits? And uh, the fact that it maybe has never done so before is no barrier right. to this guy. Right, right. Absolutely. Hmm. So we can talk about that more next week, of course. Yes. And, um, uh, it's good to talk to you. Uh, yeah, and you too. And uh, again, I'll also recommend to everybody that they take a look at your "Please Stop Doing This Very Annoying Thing" post oh. and keep that in <laughs> yes, mind it too. Was controversial. Uh, well, you know, I, I, I it's always going to be controversial to to do that. But uh, well, it's a an, an issue of long standing in the progressive community. My thing is the most amazing or alarming thing that there can possibly be. And, yeah, exactly. Uh, but uh, we understand that. Sense. But thank you for joining us again and uh, and sharing so that slap background. That's, that is going to be something to keep an eye on. You always bring us something uh, alarming that we weren't aware of. <laughs> <laughs> that's my and job. That's, that is your um, job. So you're doing I well. I just sent it to you. So you, you'll have it now Appreciate and we'll talk about it more next week. Well, thanks so much, Josie. Thank we'll talk you. again. Take care. Have a good weekend. And uh, stay sane best you can okay uh yeah let me wrap things up uh i, I wish we uh, maybe we'll have to uh try and uh and, and shoehorn an earlier time in one of these days maybe we'll get to that slap thing we can develop a longer segment on that but let me share that with you and let me share with you next what's coming up on the after show right here on netroots radio coming up next on their show summing up all the things we missed i think legal experts say breitbart's attacks on kellogg's could be a violation of the first amendment Oh, my God. The House Science Committee's tweets are an embarrassment to science. No news there, but always interesting. And a member of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, Ron Wyden of Oregon, and six other senators suggest they know of troubling aspects of Russia's role in the U.S. election, and they want the information declassified. Ron Wyden always seems to know something that he can never quite bring himself to tell us might be worth paying some attention to. From Daily Coast Radio. On NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to the K Grill in the Morning Show with David Waltman. Quickly summing up what's coming up for the last half. Well, it looks like we're in book banning mode once again, and you'll never believe who's on the chopping block this time. And also, legislation introduced by two Dems who would allow Wells Fargo customers to go to court instead of private arbitration. Sounds like a great idea. Stay tuned for all of that coming up next.